Hello and welcome to the Medic's Guide. Today we're going to cover biliary atresia. Now if you're watching this video, subscribe and share with as many people as possible. Let's try and get this knowledge out there to more people. And of course, as always, grab your pen and paper and let's get started. Now biliary atresia is an obstructive cholangiopathy involving both the intrahepatic and extrahepatic bile ducts and it presents in a neonatal period. And if left untreated, is fatal with a reported survival rate of less than 10% at three years of age. Now there are variations uh, in how often biliary atresia is reported with a high number of cases in places like Taiwan and Japan with as a written one to five in per thousand. Whereas over here in the UK, it's not as common with only one to five per 20,000. But what actually is biliary atresia? So here's a picture of the liver, gallbladder and the ducts that connect to help drain bile into the bowel. Now in biliary atresia, these ducts can be abnormally narrow, blocked or even absent altogether. Now as a result, bile can often backflow and build up. And when it builds up and builds up and builds up, the pressure within the ducts increases and then bile can squeeze through the tight junctions between epithelial cells in the lining. Now this increases the level of conjugated bilirubin in the blood and that causes that yellowing of the skin that we call jaundice. Now children present in the neonatal period with persistent jaundice, pale stool and hepatomegaly. Now any child with jaundice of over 14 days should no longer be regarded as physiological jaundice and should undergo evaluation. And in biliary atresia, jaundice extends beyond this time. Now more than half the children with biliary atresia will initially have pigmented stools and later on they will turn pale and with the progression of the disease signs of liver cirrhosis and liver failure set in with palpable hepatomegaly so an enlarged liver splenomegaly ascites signs of portal hypertension and failure to thrive now infants have this abnormal growth because there's a degree of fat and vitamin malabsorption now this might not be for everyone but there's a really good way that i use to remember this and it's all from one of my favorite clothing brands called Bape. Now, the brand always reminds me of being jaundiced because every time I look at the ape, it's always yellow. And not only that, is that this brand is from Japan, where biliary trees is most common. Now, the word Bape also tells me four things, and that is bilirubinemia, abnormal growth in the child, pale stool, and enlarged liver. Now, if you know Bape, or if it does help, then use this mnemonic and I'm sure it'll help you out a lot. Now there are a few different types. Uh, in type one, the common bile duct, which is over here, is affected. In type two, the common hepatic duct. In type two B, the hepatic duct, the cystic duct uh, as well. And then type three, it goes all the way up to the porta hepatis. Now investigation wise, there are a number of different tests that we can do. So serum bilirubin, including differentiating into conjugated and total bilirubin. And that's because total bilirubin can be normal, whereas conjugated bilirubin is always abnormally high. Now LFTs, you'll find that some of the serum bile acids and amino transferases are usually raised, but that in itself isn't really enough to differentiate between biliary atresia and other causes of neonatal cholestasis. They could also do a serum alpha-1 antitrypsin um, because deficiency may be a cause of neonatal cholestasis. The sweat test, which is for cystic fibrosis, which often involves a biliary tract. Now, ultrasound of the biliary tree and liver may show distension and tract abnormalities. Uh, ultrasound is, of course, really easy, non-invasive, uh, and can provide quite valuable information regarding the liver texture, the vasculature, patency, ascites, and can often exclude uh, other causes of ob obstructive jaundice as well. Now, liver biopsy can differentiate biliary atresia from other causes of cholestatic jaundice with quite a high level of accuracy, but again, it's quite invasive as well. And a cholangiogram will definitely diagnose biliary atresia, uh, and that's because the dye won't be able to pass through the intrahepatic and extrahepatic biliary system. So you'll be able to see that. 
Now, in terms of the management, some drugs are used as adjun adjuncts after surgery to promote biliary drainage, among them uh, steroids and ursodeoxycholic acid. But as I've written, surgical intervention is the only definitive treatment for biliary atresia, and it's something called the Kassai procedure that we often do. Now, if this procedure doesn't work, or if the child has had quite advanced liver cirrhosis, then liver transplantation is often offered. So here's just a picture to try and demonstrate the Kassai procedure. On the left here, we've got normal anatomy of the liver, the stomach, the duodenum, and then the rest of the small intestine. Now, what actually happens is in the Kassai procedure, these abnormal bile ducts are all removed. And then the small intestine, which was over here, is attached directly to the liver. So bile can drain directly into the small intestine. Uh, as I've written some complications, uh, unsuccessful anastomosis, the, of course, the liver disease can progress uh, and cirrhosis can eventually lead to hepatocellular carcinoma. So just be aware of them. And just to end things off, just a couple of questions. A baby girl born four weeks ago has had persistent jaundice since 40 hours after birth. Her parents also noticed she is reluctant to take on breastfeeding and her urine appears quite dark. Upon your examination, you confirm the infant is jaundiced and notice a firm and large liver. You review her bloods, which show a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, a serum alpha-1 antitrypsin levels and electrophoresis are normal, and the neonatal heel prick test performed at birth was negative. What is the treatment of choice for this condition? So if we can look at some of the answers here and we can rule some of them out straight away. So we know that the alpha-1 antitrypsin levels were normal. So we wouldn't really need to do this. Uh, optimizing feeds, I guess, is always important to sustain an infant, but this wouldn't really be the management of choice, given that the fact that it's unlikely that there's any con underlying condition like cystic fibrosis with a normal heel prick test as well. Remember that IV antibiotics and ursodeoxycholic acid are often used after surgery, and that leaves early surgical treatment, the Kasai procedure, as the answer. And lastly, a 15-year-old, a 15-day-old uh, baby presents to the ED with his mother. His mother states he has not been feeding or drinking well for the last two days. She believes he is not gaining much weight and his stools have been more pale than usual. On examination, you note the baby is visibly jaundiced and has hepatomegaly. Your team conducts a newborn jaundice screen with one of the differentials being biliary atresia. So what, what finding would support this diagnosis most? age of presentation we know that this happens in uh, younger younger babies newborns now raised bile acids and liver transaminases as i mentioned they they will be high but that itself won't be enough to deduce if this is biliary atresia or not what we'll do is checking the bilirubin levels now we've got unconjugated and conjugated and as i mentioned this is a condition in which conjugated bilirubin is high and so that's the answer here Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you very much if you made it this far. Make sure you smash that like button and subscribe to the channel as always. Share it with as many people as possible. And I'll be back with another video soon.